Well, I've got Vista. And, and greetings uh, from North Idaho and the snow country. Please excuse the bird in the background. It's my uh, my office mate. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he Talking up a storm. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Nelly Bears, for putting this together. Um, it's a, a real privilege. I've known Nelly for several years now, and uh, she's an absolute saint when it comes to promoting uh, online online interfacing and, and education in, in, a, in a, a virtual world. Um, and, and I'd like to get on to what the FPE Learning System for Education is and the idea behind the systematic and, uh, research and creative technology integration of classroom practice. Uh, the FPE Learning System came to me uh, approximately oh, six years ago now. I I was with a small courseware company and um, we were using um, courseware as, as a means to promote uh, training and education to to different uh, clients uh, nationally as well as you know, the in business industry, government, those kinds of things. And I came up with the idea you know, that would be very, very good for me. I'm going to Skype here. Is this me, Mary? Lower the volume. Okay. <laughs> the trouble is I can't really hear you guys. Let's see. Yeah. Is that is better now? The WizIQ, right? And the WizIQ, because otherwise mm -hmm. it comes out static. Is that better? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, less static. Yes, yes. How about now? Do you hear me now? Sorry. Okay, is that better? Okay. Uh, no, thank you, sorry. I'm, I'm, I want to share this to everybody. Um, the notion behind that basically stated it was able to uh, promote uh, education, or I should say, create a kind of to, to, the, to schools to educate our youth. It also gave our teach, uh, teachers with uh, parents more options for um, educating their children and the systematic research on what works, okay? And the idea of that is that systematic research is necessary to develop uh, anything in, the, in a creative nature for, uh, for schools to use or, or teachers to use, but you need to show that it works, okay? Um, and basically, that's exactly what I, I've been doing. Um, so there's, there's basically what, what I've stated. Accountability for schools to educate students, provide parents increased options for schooling, and do what works on systematic research. Okay? The systematic research I've been doing, um, whether it was the type of thing that part of the adjustment is close to his mouth. It's not. It's up above my head. Do you hear it now? Yeah, he says it's static. Maybe the static is because it's not near your mouth. It's it's above your. Is that the way it's supposed to be? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, there's still static. I don't know. I think it's because it's um, okay. it has to do with the way like static um, now? settings, which are probably too loud. Okay. How about now? Yeah, we hear you really well. No, no, we hear you well. Do you hear me now? You hear me really well now? You can see in the chat, everybody's thumb is up. Okay, here. I'm going to turn this microphone volume down. If I can get it to you. Yeah, now Hello? it's clear. Sorry. Now it's... Yes, yes, much you better. better now, yeah. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Test, test, test. One, two. 
I'm going to get static. Is that, is that better now? Okay. We, we, we've, come, we've come across uh, No Child Left Behind Act it was the impetus for me to move forward with this design. Um, anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm finding a cold too. In the act, uh, there, there is a, a EETT, which stands for uh, Enhancing Education Through Technology. There's a $62 million allotment of monies yearly, okay? And the, the allotment is designed to bring 25% of that allotment into direct alignment with classroom practice. Um, when I was doing my dissertation research, um, the shortfall to, edu to educational technology use in classrooms could be aligned specifically with uh, the shortfall of strategies to include technology at the student base level. Um, we use a lot of technology communications. We use it for um, uh, communi uh, not communicate, but um, for interfacing with students online, uh, like doing doing virtual classrooms. You guys keep Skyping me here. <laughs> okay, good. I'm getting out of Skype because it's, it's pestering me. Okay, quit. All right. So, $40.5 million uh, is, is allotted for educational technology directly linked into classroom practices. And that's a substantial amount of money. Um, the literature review, uh, if you want to follow a conceptual framework on founding theories, what I do is, is based on uh, technological constructivism, which is a, a natural progression in a constructivist theory. Um, when you talk about you know, Dewey, and, Dewey and Piaget and Brenda Bogotsky and Bruner, they all talked about you know, varying levels of, of constructivism based on... Hang on one second. <laughs> <laughs> My little bird goes crazy whenever I'm talking and he's, he's still doing it. Can you hear him? I hope not. Um, anyway, with constructivism, social constructivism came about um, through Vygotsky saying that basically an interaction or a social context brings about learning. Piaget, of course, said that novel stimuli in conjunction with our own experience brings about learning. And then Bruner said, no, only when varying opinions or differences of opinions come into play do we learn. Well, technological constructivism basically states that we can make meaning from technology and we don't need the interface of another individual. Um, Sims basically kind of stated that with his connectivism and saying that uh, there are you know, nodes of information that are, are outside of the context of, of social interaction. Uh, if you look at the literature gap right here in the middle, there are no strategies that include technology in the classroom practice. The, the, the students are ready for it. Um, the teachers know it's there. They know they need to do it. But there really was no strategy at the time of my literature review, as well as now, to my knowledge, that actually align bringing technology directly into a student-based level. Um, the three levels of technology I discovered in my research were personal technology, which basically anything that you bring to the table as an individual, um, your skill set masteries with you know, Microsoft Office products, anything else you do, screen capture tools. Organizational technology is anything that the organization adds to the mix, whether it be a linking through learning management systems, whether it be um, uh, you know, bringing, bringing students as, as a, uh, for an online class or preparation. Uh, to, to overhead projectors and smart boards, all those things because are organizational. The two together, when you talk about them, they both really interface, or I should say, uh, respond to the other, meaning the more, more organizational technology you have, the people have, the personal technology gets, gets uh, uh, added because organization then makes it important for a person to take their personal technology and use it in conjunction with organizational technology and vice versa. The creative aspect, what I'm leaning on, is bringing a student-based, technology-enhanced pedagogy into practice academically. Using the student's own creative powers, his own personal technologies, and to take that and make the student the master of their own learning. Um, creative technology, because of the fact the students are using it, 
does does support organizational technology, but organizational technology does not uh, support the creative process. It only interfaces with the personal. So this is the whole foundation or the founding founding principles of the FPE learning system for education. To bring creative technology practices into into this into the classroom as a means to promote student-based technology enhanced pedagogy. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Uh, we talked about the personal technology or any technology skill sets the student brings to the educational table, no matter what they are. And you can work with the different levels through assessment, finding out where the person's, you know, where they land. Uh, organizational technology, all technology is provided by the organization to enhance the learning experience, no matter what that is. But the creative technology is a student-based technology and pedagogical practice. And this is all lined out in the book. Okay, everything is in there from step one all the way through to, to the learning management system or actually using um, the learning, uh, FPP server site for storage of your digital repositories. Okay. Now the pedagogical question then is, uh, how do we bring creative educational technology into classroom practice? Well, simply stated, you have to use it. I think Dr. Deutsch was the one that kind of got me on going on that. You know, it doesn't matter what the technology is, you have to, you have to use it. Um, so, bringing it to the forefront as opposed to using it in the periphery is the whole quest that I've been on for the last, oh, about three and a half years now. Now, with this comes a, comes a real big question, and or I should say a, kind of a change in mindset. Uh, the teacher now becomes the facilitator. Uh, Carol 2003 is the guide on the side versus the stage on the stage. Is, a lot of people know that particular uh, quote. What we're basically doing is we're changing the dynamics of the teacher to the role of the facilitator. You're no longer standing there as a harbinger of all the information. We're working with students and guiding them to create their own learning. And this is exactly what the book is about, as, as well as my conceptual frame, framework. Um, I don't think I'll, have, I'll see any questions at this juncture. I'm going to continue on. The conceptual framework of the FP learning system takes techno technologically based research. We, uh, as educators, have to give the students places to go. I use Purdue Owl. I have several um, different uh, uh, hyperlinks that I use in conjunction with this particular practice. And if anybody would like to have those, I'd be more than happy to send you word notes um, that will help you to gain, you know, gain insight for it. And I've got a list of theories. I've got all sorts of stuff in there. Uh, the second step is to take that information after it's gleaned from the internet and use it and put it into a Microsoft Word product. Okay, the Word then Word doc becomes the uh, you know, a, a gradable a gradable document. And you guide the guide the students through that process as well. And then you want to take the benchmarking from the Word Word doc and you want to turn it into a PowerPoint. Um, that those are of course are typical things that, that people would have to do in career outside of school and for school as well. Um, the, the real big part here is the narration part. Uh, PowerPoint allows you to narrate. Um, I use Sony Soundforge, but um, you can you can you can narrate right on your PowerPoint. It's not a big deal. And then what we do is from that position is we convert that to a flash design. Um, the flash design is is a click and play. Um, part of the problems with using uh, PowerPoint as a as a, an access online is compatibility of our software. If um, we're working with 2005 and I'm creating PowerPoint in 2013, you're not going to be able to open my PowerPoint. You're going to have to do a bunch of downloads and workarounds just to be able to see what I'm presenting. And that obviously presents an issue. So by converting it to Flash, everybody can download a Flash, the Flash from Adobe. It's free. And you just click, click on it and it will download itself for you. And you can create your own Flash player design. And each of these then turns into uh, a savable format for review and sharing on an FTP server or hard copy storage. Now, one of the things of this particular design is that the hard copy storage circumvents internet uh, issues like we have today. Um, the internet is great. However, um, like today, I had a con connectivity issue until just recently, so I wasn't able to share this information with you. Um, so, you know, a hard copy version of the same same pro uh, pro program is a, is a wonderful option. Okay. Now I went ahead and I created what's called a waterfall. This is uh, Christopher Christopher Horner, and um, 
basically we're, we're taking each of these steps, okay, websites for research, ethical requirements are necessary when you're talking about students because you cannot just place anybody under the age of 18 in an open source uh, access for other people to view without uh, with parental permission. And, and that's an important part of it. So you need to, to, to address the ethics requirement as well. Um, benchmarks for topic or subject, uh, subject specific content, we talked about that. And then file protocol. File protocol is a really necessary evil, though many seem to think that it's uh, unnecessary. Um, I created a, a folder protocol that allows you to control your, all, your, all your information from step one through to the end of the, the, the FTP server interface. Um, it's, it's really important because a lot of the software likes to save to places that are difficult to find. And um, I use Articulate uh, Suite. Articulate has its own folders it likes to save all the information to. And then I don't necessarily have access to it. So I like to create a folder protocol that basically controls, and you teach the students to do this, and controls all of your information and places it in one place. And you can go back. I've gone back several years. A colleague in Chicago said one of my links wasn't working. I opened up uh, the, the old folder, and I went in there and redid it and replaced it right back on my, on my website. And I did it in almost real time. I did it in less than an hour. Okay. Um, the Microsoft Word doc, depending on where you're at and what level of education you're talking about, a lot of people use MLA uh, at the junior college where I teach here. They use MLA still. APA is pretty much the standard for anything after junior college. So teaching students proper APA formatting, um, teaching them, you know, we sometimes place word counts, and of course grammar is necessary too. And to be honest, I've been lucky, um, graduated from the University of Phoenix, in that I have access to their WritePoint software, which is where I, I send all my students' information with. And WritePoint comes back with an academic profile for them so they can see where they need to, uh, to fix their, their, their presentations. Anyway, PowerPoint presentation, um, the template creation, of course, uh, design parameters basically driven by educators, uh, animations, and timings for narration. Um, Timings are, are interesting, an interesting concept. Um, there is much research and literature available saying that if the timings are, are out of sync, we actually are forced to take in information from two separate learning style uh, propensities. Um, if they're in sync, we tend to either view them visually or listen to them verbally. Um, if you put them out of sync, it, we, it's kind of like the two learning styles fight with each other, and they actually learn from two separate, two separate directions. Okay. The narration. Um, audio recording, of course, you can use PowerPoint. Um, you can use exterior software. Um, or you can import audio. Uh, you know, you can actually go to a, oh, I don't know, uh, if you wanted to go to a professional studio to, to narrate, you can actually import. Okay. Um, anyway, that's a great question. I see a question. Why use Flash with the advent of HTML5? Are you thinking of changing? Interestingly, uh, Articulate's already addressed that. Um, Flash uses, of course, HTML. The HTML5 and, and uh, uses it. We use that for Apple as well as for uh, mobile devices. You can do both. The, the, the new Articulate actually creates files um, that do do actually both of those. And yes, Articulate is expensive, but so is Adobe and anything else. But they do allow you for downloads if you wanted to, to test, test the, uh, the design out. But anyway, um, file transfer protocol, um, hypertext markup language, or HTML or HTML5, is how you create your pathways to access your, your server. How you can maintain it hard copy. Okay. The folder protocol that I use uh, is a real one. Uh, you you right-click on your desktop, select folder. I, I went ahead and arbitrarily named it the main. And within the main, you have a work folder that you create. And all your work is created within that folder, including any subjects on the topic that you happen to be speaking about. Within that, you'll have maybe several different folders that are topic specific. If you're studying science and you want to talk about uh, botany or photosynthesis, or if you're, you could have a plethora of different kinds of content-specific folders, each time that you publish to a flash design, you publish it back into the main, and it actually publishes into a folder file 
right here and right next to the work folder. So what you've got is the work folder itself with all the different, you know, different uh, folders, specific content folders within the work folder. And then as you publish, you're publishing them right next to the work, the work folder, which allows you then to go back and do any kind of modifications that you may want uh, for future use. Okay. Student-based research or brain-based, task-based, uh, many names exist for the same concept, um, but they, we found that uh, literature is full of this, that students lo learn more when they're tasked with their own learning. It's an immersive strategy that puts the student at center stage versus the information at center stage. It, it really engages the inquisitive nature of our students and actually gets them involved in the learning process. This is a real big deal. Um, we are sitting, most countries in fact are sitting on an industrial revolution type format for education. It's time to move out of innovation and get into digitization finally and, and start moving ahead. This is a necessary step. It's a, it's a construct that's, that, that's been sitting here languishing for, for, for dec a couple of decades now. And it's really important to start thinking about where are these students going to get their jobs? My, my son came home and said, you know, this is the first time, Dad, when half of the jobs are going to, my half of the job potentials I have are going to be replaced by robots. And I told him, I said, well, that's great. So what do you think you should get into? And he said, robotics. I said, absolutely. So there's going to be not only the loss of jobs to the technology, there's also going to be the creation of jobs for technology. And this is kind of how we have to lean. If we're going to be creating jobs that are technologically oriented, then we need to really con seriously consider how to teach our students. Um, maintain the core principles of STEM and all those are, are viable, but that you, we really need to, to make a paradigm shift in how we do business. We need to start thinking about what are these students going to do, what skill sets are going to be necessary here in the next 10 years uh, in, in the job market. How, how are they going to get a job if they're, if they're, if they're mechanically based? And there are no ways to, to address that unless we start bringing technology to the forefront and using it as, as a, a means to teach our students. Okay, um, we went ahead and I went ahead and just kind of blew these slides up for you. This kind of gives you a bigger view of the, of the Word doc. Uh, most people use Word docs. I like, I like to use uh, the AP format. Of course, I'm, I'm going through the University of Phoenix. They, they require everything to be an APA. And it can be a real pain, but there's some really inexpensive stuff out there uh, that uh, you can purchase that will set up your Word docs for you so that you don't have to go through all the arduous processes of creating Word docs and then trying to go through and make an APA format. It's a, it's a simple thing. I think I paid $15 for um, an APA, uh, APA formatable uh, software. So it, there's no excuse not to, not to use AP or MLA. And, and teach our students exactly how, how to proceed with that. Um, of course, the PowerPoint template creation. PowerPoint uh, has many bells and whistles that we don't even touch in schools. Um, they're busy trying to get them to write papers. They're busy force feeding them information. Creating a PowerPoint on the benchmarks for uh, our Word doc. Um, APA formatable example. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Are they practicing technical yeah, skills? Um, okay, go I'm going to move forward. Nelly, are go you going to um, maybe compile these questions for the end? Okay. okay. So anyway, you um, need, need to consider the design parameters of your PowerPoint, um, the animations, the timings for narration. Um, again, the timings are not that critical. If you learn to uh, to you know, set, set up your, your animations to, to move like you'd like them to, you can go ahead and, and put your timings in and it won't be, it's not necessary to actually be totally to each of the mo mo movements of your animations because people then are forced to learn more than and just one learning style. Um, narration I found to be one of the hardest things in this, in this particular model because it has to do with, a, I have an audiology friend, a colleague down in, in Houston, and um, Dr. Dr. Lily Green. And Lily, basically, she says, she told me, she said, the reason we have such a hard time with audio is because we've never heard our voices before. And if you think about it, the resonance of our inner ear and our skulls and whatnot, 
give us a, a skewed idea about how we sound. Um, the first time I did a narration, I thought, oh my goodness, I sound like I'm underwater. And the man I was working with um, told me, he said, you get the perfect narration voice. I want you to do all of our, all of our modules. Well, I had to kind of eat crow, and I had to think about that for a while. But I have been doing narrations now since 2008. And you know, people, people have actually approached me on planes. I had a lady approach me on a plane and said, you seem really familiar to me. <laughs> And I had no idea. I'd never met her before. And I asked her where she worked, and she told me she worked for a, a company called Aging and Long Term Care of Eastern Washington. And I had done all their training modules. <laughs> so she recognized my voice and um, said I sounded exactly like on the uh, on the recordings. Well, that's that's exactly what I had to to, to learn to deal with. You're going to sound like like you're underwater. You're not going to like your own voice, but you need to give it the practice necessary to to be able to get the narration up, up to speed so that your, your presentations are, are, are good to go for others to view. Okay. All right, the flash process. The file, pro, uh, file transfer protocol at the FTP server site uses a small web formatting. And then you can, of course, link that to hypertext markup language. A good way to describe this is to look in your URL code in the upper left-hand corner of, your, of, the, of this particular presentation http dot or colon forward slash forward slash live dot is IQ. All those are, those forward slashes are giving you different um, levels within the computer that log you into this session. Um, it's really not a hard thing to do. And HTML5, all we do is we put a, a 5 on the end of the HTML here. And so all the, all the information that you have placed on your server will be accessible for uh, not only a PC, but any other device that's out there, including Apple. Uh, Apple also has uh, workarounds that will actually read Flash. Most of them now will allow you to read Flash. So it's really not an issue. Um, some of your smaller PDAs, however, do need need to think about. You do need to think about uh, HTML5 because the Androids won't play all of all of it the way the you, you designed it in the first place. So that that could be an, an issue. Um, yeah. So let's, let's just move on. Okay. Yes, articulate is expensive. However, I'll be I'll be honest with you. It's not any more than anything else. Um, I'm not I'm not selling articulate studio. I, I do have a, a liaison ship with uh, Mark Schwartz, who's the executive vice president of Articulate Global. But only in that um, him and I have, have have known each other since about 2008. I use articulate because for me it was it's easy to use. Um, Leptora has Snap. Um, of course, Adobe has can uh, well version of the Camtasia as well as Captivate. And they all do the same basic thing, but I have found that Articulate Presenter is much easier for me to work with. It's as simple as hitting publish to save your your presentation to a um, to a, uh, a a file for your for your upload on your server. You have old Articulate 5. Articulate 5, I, that was the first one I started with. And it worked just fine. It does exactly the same thing. Most of it has to do with the iconology changing, kind of like uh, between uh, 2005 and 2010 MS Office uh, that changed a lot of the icons and stuff like that. And you had to kind of look around. But once you get used to working with it, it's not hard to work with. Um, it's, a, it's a simple process. Articulate also has the ability to narrate. Um, I found that it was a little statically in the earlier models, but the newer ones um, aren't, aren't a big deal. They work really well. The neat thing about Studio is, or, and you use Presenter mostly, Presenter allows you to, to, to put in clip art, allows you to put in video. Okay, you can capture video off, off the line, like from, from YouTube or something, and you can place it in a presentation. Um, it has a video encoder, which actually turns it into small web format and allows you then to play it just like it was when it was on YouTube within your presentation. You engage in the quiz maker. Engage is a PowerPoint slide on steroids. It has many, many levels on slides so that the person has to physically interact with the slide to move forward. Um, the quiz maker, you can, you can set up assessments within, your, within the quizzes that will actually Text, not text, but to email you the results for each of your students. And then replay is like like um, Camtasia, if you're familiar with that. 
it's a, a like a video timeline kind of a thing. Um, I am not. I don't advocate any of these totally. I'm I'm not kind of open that way. My whole process is, is surrounded about using Flash as a design parameter. Okay. Right. The digital repository also can at the student base level can be called a digital portfolio. Um, many, there's many, um, in fact I've had several job interviews here recently where they wanted um, visual representation of what I do. And the only way to do that is to, is to maintain a digital, uh, a personal digital uh, portfolio. And all I did was create a bunch of hyperlinks and put a little blurb on exactly what the hyperlinks were about. And I turned, I gave that, of course, I put them on a Word doc and I sent it to them. And they can, they can click on each of the, of the digital hyperlinks and go into the different presentations I've created. I've got over 300 of them now. And uh, they're still all functioning, they're still on my server. Um, the neat thing about an FTP is that it allows, it, you can have them either at the student, at the uh, school base level or you can maintain your own. I maintain a personal one for business. Schools have them as well. FTPs allow students the ability to 24-7 access information. Um, presentations can be designed as for, for review, for research, for remediation for students. They can be uh, peer created, meaning small group small group uh, design where you actually take people and put them into small groups, create a presentation, place them on the uh, FTP site for your school, and then they can, people can come, uh, next, next generation students coming through the class can actually access the information uh, that other, their other peers have created. You can actually use it as a learning tool where you say, I really like this presentation, but it's missing something. Can you come up with something and add to this? And they can take the information off the server, and they can turn right around and utilize it in conjunction with their, with their classroom and add or subtract things or edit it um, to create something new and dynamic. You are creating uh, basically a living representation of the student's work. And that is new and novel totally to education. Most of the time, students, uh, they come and go in our classrooms. They do well or they do poorly, depending on, of course, their motivation or your ability to motivate them. And they leave, and they take the information that they've generated over the years with them. And that's, that's tragic. Um, you know, students sometimes come up with some really interesting things that, that teach us as educators. And to lose that information to the next generation coming in is something we need to, to address. By maintaining a digital repository of knowledge, we are giving the students the ability to place their, their work okay, online for us and for future generations that heretofore hasn't been addressed. So, FileZilla, that's exactly what I use. <laughs> All right, learning style alignments. The neat thing, one of the neat things about this, I did my master's degree on learning style inventories as a curricular alignment strategy. Had it put into the library of which is copy written. It's on my website if you guys want to visit that. Um, I use uh, Sean Whiteley's uh, Limletics Learning Style Inventory as a means to uh, align my curriculum or find out how my students like to learn. And, uh, and I arranged my curriculum so that I, I play directly to their strengths. The neat thing about these, these, uh, these, these flash designs is that they play to every one of the potentials depending on how you use it in class. Um, the only one that would, some people would say that there was issues with the physical and the social. Well, if you interact with the computer with your hands, it's physically oriented. The social has to do with small team concept and you're creating presentations. So it actually plays to all seven of the ones that Whiteley, Whiteley describes. And this has kind of raised some interesting, some interesting uh, theories, in my opinion. Um, Mainly, the opinion I have, have, or this query I have, is of intelligence. The, main, the other thing about this particular model is that it aligns with educational constructs considered considered bug in education. The flipped classroom right now is a real, real biggie. Um, giving students access to their information the day before the class. Um, by having a digital repository of knowledge, they have information for the whole year, in, in many cases, before each of the classes appears. Um, 
response to intervention is now called some uh, system systematic something I forget exactly. But the tiering approach, if they need a lot of remediation, they can access the, the digital repository as a as a means to give them heads up on what you're trying to teach them. Um, differentiated instruction is is it, uh, that pretty much you know you're using a different different mode each. And many students really um, uh, cleave to technology as a means to, to gain information. Which brings us to Howard Garner stuff. Okay, the, the query I have has to do with um, if, if students gravitate towards multiple intelligence, or not multiple intelligence, technology is a means to learn. Might we think that perhaps there is actually another another piece of this pie, um, a ninth Learn, uh, learning style and multiple intelligence where students interface. I mean, I just spent a few minutes with uh, Mr. Sign on, 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 on Skype here, and he was really good at getting in here and working from wherever he's at. I believe he's in India. And he's doing his thing virtually with me on my laptop sitting here in northern Idaho. Now, he's obviously got a ability with uh, technology, and if he uses that as a means to educate himself, then why would he want to do anything else? That's kind of one of the questions I have. Um, the flipped classroom, okay, review of material, digital repositories of knowledge the night before the class, content can be assimilated you know, at, a, at a greater pace by students, is a really wonderful idea. Um, giving students a heads up ahead of time is, uh, to me, that makes perfect sense. I mean, why wait until classroom time just to sit and you know listen to something when you when you can actually review it the night before, and it's not the same old boring read this chapter or watch the boring video of the boring professor standing up in front of you. It's it's a person designed by either the peers or the instructor that has all the the, the core benchmark information in it. and it prepares them for the next class so that they can spend more class time discussing the topic as opposed to trying to learn the topic. This, this is a, and it's becoming quite vocal all over the United States. I don't know about other countries, um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great idea. The differentiated instruction, uh, FPE learning may be used as an alignment strategy for differentiated instructional design. You can plug in pretty much any, you know, anything that you want to do in regards to these, to these different, different sections to differentiate the classroom. Uh, you can use a digital portfolio. Um, as a as a guide for kids to learn their, their colors or their squares, you can use a guide for studying history. You can use it as a guide for you know, simple physics up through math as a means to educate them on English. Like um, I lost audio there for a second. Let me see if I can get back. Intelligence thing. If modern students are drawn to educational technology, it's preferred method to learn. Then does the possibility exist that a digital interface educationally may be viewed as yet another example of multiple intelligence? That 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 question really struck me. I've been in contact with Howard Garner. He um, He's, the, the jury is out, as it were, <laughs> at this juncture. Um, but I'm going to continue to ask him about this because this, this to me, it, you know, we are changing all the time. In fact, um, I'm working with a, a colleague out of Sacramento who works with Asperger syndrome children. Johns Hopkins, one of the doctors that works with Asperger kids, um, came up with an interesting speculation or conjecture, if, if I will. Um, he basically was stating, and this is this is kind of 
kind of out there, but if you think about it, it may just be true. Is Asperger's the next evolution of mankind? Um, you know, they're terribly intelligent. They just don't like socialization. They are the perfect people to be plugging into a technological interface to teach. In fact, we have found through a pilot study that um, these students really, really love to do technology, and it's a really neat, a neat way to um, to get rid of issues with behavioral crisis. Uh, they don't like socialization. They don't like to talk to them. You can eat them in the way they think. Um, so if you plug them into the same presentation that you're trying to get them to do socially, but yet you're and you know, they're starting to get upset, if you plug them into the computer and the same information, they, they will look at it over and over and over again until they get the information correct in their assessments. Um, this, this is a, a new way of looking at how to teach this particular population. And uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Catherine Buchanan, down in Sacramento, she's one of three, um, three autism specialists nation that is certified through the, through the federal government to, to do this kind of research. She's putting together a, uh, a, uh, a grant at this time, and we're going to create a digital portfolio of uh, a repository of knowledge for these kids to be able to interface with. And we're going to take the existing curriculum and we're going to digitize it. Um, this, is, this is exciting stuff. It uh, really changes how, how these students learn. And I'm just talking about them. We're going into it. the pilot study with SD students provided enhanced attention to digital interface and a means to promote educational transfer without the associated socialization issues with ASD students. It's a potential behavioral crisis intervention strategy that seems to work at this juncture. Um, just to give you a heads up for the systematic research we're talking about, um, in the pilot study I did last year at this time, I took four post-secondary students and I exposed them to six two-hour uh, uh, workshops on this conceptual framework. Um, I was blown away by their by their their formative and summative assessments in that they realized a 30% overall increase in perceived self-efficacy with techno educational technology pre and post assessment. Now, that's that's an awful lot, and I I, I admit I was like, my goodness, that's that's impossible. <laughs> but come to find out, um, I had another student that I did a case study on in, in the fall. He was computer literate, um, very good at what he does. Um, he had a 16% increase in reported self-efficacy with creative educational technology. And I just started the new round of, of uh, educational technology with two more students uh, doing case studies on two of them, one of which is a high school student. And there, both of them are excelling at this particular type of interface. Um, I'm hoping to eventually get a teacher because that would be the cyclic nature of education. You know, your, your, your school, your, 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 everything. Uh, your primary student versus your secondary student versus your teacher. And if I can get a positive interface or a positive response to, to this particular model in all three venues, then it's obvious to me that uh, we can start making this, surmising that this actually is, is, is actually effective. Um, so I, the jury is still out, but I'm working towards that goal. And um, I'm going to continue these case studies as long as I can get people to inv be involved with them. And uh, they, at this juncture, it seems to work, and it works wonderfully. So I'm going to continue, continue to do this in hopes that uh, eventually it will take off. Now, a little caveat to all of this. I am not advocating uh, use flash player electronic learning for uh, a replacement for educational practices, but rather as an enrichment designed to bring student-based free of technology enhanced practices into the classroom. I want people to understand that this is an and with type of mentality and not an either or. Uh, creative technology integration seems to work based on this systematic research that I've been conducting, and the benefits are many with no apparent negatives. Um, I have yet to have anybody report they didn't either didn't like it or were dissatisfied with it, had uh, negative outcomes. Uh, the only the only thing or a stipulation I would have is uh, in some sort of vocational background where you have to do a skill set mastery, uh, showing somebody like a good example of this would be CPR certification. Um, 
you can do all of the, the airway, breathing, and cardio, um, all the stuff that you have to do the eight hours worth of reading and testing. You can do all of that, but the actual skill set mastery of pushing and blowing on the mannequin uh, would, would require that you sit face to face with somebody. Um, this is the only drawback to this particular type of, um, of education and practice. Uh, everything else seems to show a positive effect, and, and that's, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm totally blessed, and I'm falling onto something wonderful, and I'm hoping that, the, that not only the nation but the world will see this and, and move towards this direction. And I really would like to say that I, I not only not only encourage, but I challenge other educators to to find uh, either a modification of this strategy or a way to to bring uh, technology into the classroom. And uh, if you can do that, um, I really think that we can get out of the mindset of standing in little rows with our students and being the total harbinger of the information and actually get them involved in the learning process. And I really would like to encourage you to do that. That's kind of where I'm at at this juncture. Um, talked about all this other stuff, medical intelligence, um, special needs, pilot study, the case study. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I, at the bottom of the page is the Nova Publishers. Um, their hyperlink to the, oops, my goodness, I lost you guys. Is my hyperlink to, uh, to the actual book that I just put out. Um, the second edition will have will have the uh, case study information in it as it becomes available. Um, I'm not necessarily here to promote the book, but it has been recommended to the University of Phoenix for curriculum uh, in EDT 711 Introduction to Educational Technology Research. Um, I, I'm, I again I'm blessed, and uh, I don't know what else I can say at this juncture. But I hope you guys enjoyed what I had to say. And again, Ooh, I apologize. Thank you, Dale. For the lateness or tardiness. That's a great um, news. Um, um, Dr. Deutsch. Good to hear a lot of really nice things, and I'm really, really happy. And I'm blessed to know you. Really? <laughs> I feel very, very honored uh, to uh, to know and, and to, to see how well you're doing. That's very encouraging. How can we, there were some questions here, but one question comes to mind. How do we get started? We're, we're interested. What do we do? For step one, two, three, and so on. Well, um, uh, the first thing you can do is back and look at this presentation again. Um, what, you, what you really need to think about is, first of all, don't be afraid. Um, if you're afraid of the technology, I had I noticed on the. Um, the, the, the MN3, the, the introduction to the, the programming, one of, one of the, uh, the postings on there was, I'm really afraid of creative technology. Well, creative technology is nothing to be afraid of. It's, um, we've been using a technological interfacing for some time. We just have not really tapped into the, the, the dynamics of this creative process. And, and that's really kind of what I, I want to say. Um, the more you can bring fit in your classroom practice, Okay. The more that you can realize that the students themselves have more information than you do, um, that was something I came to came to fruition for me with my with my group when I did the pilot study. I'm standing there in front of them, and I this is my first time with a, one of those smart boards. It, was, it wasn't a Prometheus; it was a North Idaho College's version of it, and I didn't know how to turn it on. So my student came up and she showed me how to turn this silly thing on, and the reality of that is, is that we learn from our students. They're there to teach us, not vice versa. You're there with information that they're supposed to have, but you know, it really boils down to understanding that many times their skill sets are going to transcend our own, and be okay with that, because everything, lifelong learning, basically dictates that we we need to embrace something new every day to get this creative process going. The first thing I would really suggest that you consider doing is Get your hands on a bunch of, of uh, hyperlinks to, to viable research sites. I use Eric. I use um, I use uh, there's a alphabetical list of uh, journals out there. Um, Nelly, is there a no, way I can, can send you something there, here Tom on a Word doc it, on this particular yeah. thing, or do I have to do, do it, that on your um, on the uh, in the course area, the WizIQ. Well, if you click on that. 
you're able to um, add things there. Mm -hmm. Do do you use Google Drive at all? Do you use Google Drive? Okay. Well, now do you have do you have all? Do you mm, okay. I'm going to be op uh, honest with you. I, I, I'm leery of open source stuff. Um, it has to do with, uh, first of all, I just caught the crypto lock virus and uh, had to had to read my entire system. It took me three days, and I got that through um, through an open source. I won't want to put you no know, past disparaging remarks, but I got it from an open source you know issue, and I don't like that. I mean, it wiped out six years worth of my work and. I had to go back and glean information from all sorts of different places, including my my backup drives and all this stuff, to be able to come up to about 80% of, of my information. Luckily, all of my my presentations and whatnot were on my server, so I, I didn't lose that much. But I mean, it still was a three-day hassle. So I stay away from. And it also, you have an issue with the Google Drive. I just did. A, I just conducted a um, a webinar. It was four sessions with a Chicago school district, and um, Kids had created their PowerPoints on Google. Well, they were having issues get off of Google back onto their desktop. And, you know, it should be total control to me. To me, it, everything should be a controllable unit. Um, if you want to create the PowerPoint off on Google Docs or something like that and bring it back to your your, your, your desktop, then that's okay with me. I mean, I'm, I, I have no issues with that. And whatever you're comfortable with, I think that's really important too. Because I'm not asking you to, to you know, to pick an entire mindset change of things. I, I'm, I'm basically an advocate of use what works, but also integrate something new. So if you got, your, got your good, um, your good hyperlinks for, um, you know, your information for people to reach, and then, then from there, teach them to write a decent paper. Um, the paper then turns into the PowerPoint. You can actually stop at PowerPoint, and then of course just do, you know. Uh, uh, a blended approach where it doesn't stand alone. If you want to, you can you can use that in conjunction with you know classroom presentations and small student concept, and then have the students they become they become the the researcher, the producer, okay, they become the creator, and and they become the critique of each other's work that way. Um, that's not that I'm building on Likert stuff out of uh, 2008, but he basically had the same idea, uh, not the same, but Basically, the conceptual idea was there. Um, using it, using it as a means to promote student-based activities. Um, you know, we, many times we just say, "Look, here's the information. Uh, go look this up. Go look that up," and then we we cut our students loose, and, and they're not involved in the creative process in class. That's that's important. You know, we, we need to we need to bring them forward. Um, as far as the as the using the FPE learning model goes. The book is a is is my goodness. It's a step by step a how to. It includes everything we just talked about, and of course, it's a, a whole lot more of it actually, uh, because I was trying to keep this time down to a, a reasonable time frame. But it tells you about the file protocols, how to how to how to generate everything you need to do is, is in the book. Uh, the book is spendy. I'll be honest with you, Nova. I had no idea that they were going to publish it to begin with. And second of all, they're looking at it like it's a curriculum book. So, and it, it is. It's becoming curriculum for EDT 711 for University of Phoenix uh, through Dr. Armstrong's efforts. So, I'm uh, I'm really advocating what I'm advocating you doing is taking a 15 to 30 minute piece of time out of your day and plug in technology at the student base level and watch what happens. Um, it might be my guess that what you're going to see is it's going to become their favorite time of day, and then it's also going to become uh, the day that they actually the information that they learn the most. And it's because that they're creating the learning, you're not forced to. That's really what I'm trying to get you guys to do. Um, it's really it's, it's important. It's 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 how how education needs to proceed because we're we're failing. We're failing terribly. Uh, the United States, for instance, that uh, we're supposedly you know, gaining all this ground, and we're not gaining anything. I mean, the NAEP shows that. <coughs> Excuse me, pardon me, cold. NAEP shows that we keep we continue to slide in reference to uh, you know world 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 efforts. Uh, uh, China's doing really well. Uh, 
the Middle East is doing really well. Uh, and it's because they're using a technological interfacing that they're getting all this, they're getting all these accolades. Um, that's that's the, the, the binder, is, if you will, the cement between the bricks. It's really changing how people do business. It's, it's they're embracing the technological interface and they're getting away from the old brick and mortar. Um, brick and mortar is not going to go anywhere. The teacher is just going to change how they do business a little bit. And in reality, if the students are creating their information for you, it's going to take the load off. All you have to do, you're going to have to keep the digital. Sorry for students to in, to access. Uh, Repository on the particular subject. Cotton Academy, or uh, Cotton University, is a real good example of this. They, he's, he, is, uh, he has solicited people from all over the world to add to his, his university. And there's stuff in there from all sorts of different things. And my goodness, and he's got a digital repository of knowledge that's based on these different people's you know, producing information. Well, uh, the only issue with that is a lot of these guys are they're, they're out there when it comes to. What did Einstein say? Einstein says that um, a really smart person uh, is viewed as a crazy person by a person who's not so smart. So <laughs> it's the reality of that is is that some of these people are you know way above our heads and we're not able to interface. Where students will be dealing with the same grade level, okay, producing the same information year after year after year, and well, why not harness yes. that and use it? Um, I'm that makes sense as to you? you're speaking. Um, Nelly. Are there? Yeah, the sound left and it came back. Any any other yeah. comments or questions? Um, Dale, I'm just at a place where I think schools need to uh, stop what they're doing and start all over again. Because, yeah, yeah. So I. Well, you're not. You're, you're speaking to the choir. <laughs> I agree. Go I ahead. Agree no, totally. I'm, I'm waiting for you to continue. So you agree totally. Hello? Oh, oh no, I, 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 I'm with you 100%. And that's kind of why I've dedicated the, the rest of my professional life to pursuing this model and other models like it, if others exist. To my knowledge, this is the only, one, only strategy or model that directly plugs into a student-based technology enhanced uh, application for classroom practice. Um, with that in mind, I, I, I'm hoping that what this does is that it, it, it challenges other people to come up with designs of, of a similar strategy. Because that's the shortfall. There are no strategies that bring technology into the classroom other than just like overhead projection as a, as a means to, excuse me, I think I'm quite in the school, uh, as a means to, to have students interact, you know, at, at a visual level or just, in other words, it's just like bells and whistles as opposed to getting them in the creative process. And creative technology is, is a new term, it's a new idea, and I really would like the people to, to run with this and start using the idea of, of the students, the, the creators of their own learning. This is where I'm at at this juncture, and I'm, I'm really passionate about this. Um, if it didn't work, I'd say, you know, okay, let's try something else, maybe back to the drawing board. But it's working. If that's that's what's scary about this. I, I mean, I, I feel blessed in many regards because it is working, and by all by all indications, high school kids is getting it too. And if that's the case, all we have to do is go down the down the uh, the roster and age to find out wh where this is actually a viable strategy. And if it's not a viable strategy in its entirety, how much of it can we use? And I have. <laughs> I have um, Sean Banks out of out of magnet school in Chicago. Had two little girls, and this is on my website if you'd like to look at it. Two little girls, one was a kindergartner, one was a first grader, went online and asked the question, was Thomas Alva Edison a global citizen? And they put together the seven criteria that were global citizens, researched each of the criteria in, in reference to Thomas Alva Edison and came up with, yes, indeed, he was a global citizen. But the point being in all that, these kids were kindergartners and first graders. 
And she says, Dale, I still talk to them to this day, and they still remember about Thomas Alva Edison, the other students in class who invented the light bulb. And they had all of this information. So um, to me, that was pretty much a, a, a teller, as it will, as it were, in that this really works. And they, they researched their own information. They produced it. The old read, write, and recite kind of comes to mind. You, you read it online. You bring it, in, you bring it into play, collect the information. You recite it. You write, excuse me, and then you recite it okay, through narration. Well, then it produces something that students can be proud of. Um, it's amazing how kind of fuck like chickens <laughs> and are all excited about their presentations. And to me, owning owning the knowledge is is half the battle. So you know, I'm going to continue to push this. I really want people to get involved. Um, people can 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 contact me. Um, here, I'm going to give my put my uh, my email down. Anybody that wants to contact me, and uh, yeah, it doesn't matter whatever your question is. There's no such thing as a dumb question. It's Dale at FPE Learning. Uh, um, my website is is FPE Learning. Um, dot com. Okay, and if you'd like to go in there and look around, you can use anything that's on my site. Um, you know, as long as you just give credit where credit's due. I'm totally okay with you guys using anything that's on the site. You can link to it. Uh, believe it or not, uh, my, my action research project for University of Phoenix, my master's degree, is the number one thing that's been hit on uh, because I used a template from the University of Phoenix. And apparently, because it was published uh, in the Library of Congress copyright, um, it uh, has, has some weight. So people are using it as a template to do action research projects. Um, that's the kind of thing that education is about. You know, it, it's the sharing, the giving back and forth, um, sharing of knowledge. You know, interfacing. The, the internet has put the world's information at our fingertips. You literally can find topics on anything you want. Um, we need to har we need to harness that and use it in conjunction with schools. I mean, there's, you know, yes, you need filters. You need, you know, to be, to be you know, aware. You cannot just turn people loose and expect them to come up with good stuff. Those kids will be kids, and they'll do they'll do silly things if you give them a chance. But as long as you're you know overseeing them, and that's a, that's the most important thing. And they they, they learn to, to surf properly. They learn we, we guide them towards you know viable places for um, their research. We we, we uh, do constructive criticism on how they're writing. Teach them how to write academically. Um, help them with the, the creation of their powerpoints, and then push a button to publish it to Flash. It's really that simple. It's not that hard. Um, in, of all the things, the hardest part is is, is creating the hyperlink, and that's that's really no biggie either. And that's of course it's in the book as well. It's a start to finish, um, has everything there for you. Um, and if you have any other questions or that kind of thing, you can email me. You can contact me. My even my cell phone number is there. So if you really have a question that needs to be answered and you, and you cannot get Thank an answer you. from Thanks me, and I always answer so my much, emails. everybody for joining and us. By Thank all means. Uh, for uh, coming through. I think that's the important thing, the fact that um, you made it. And I hope that you feel better uh, with your cold. And that the weather, uh, you know, spring, spring should be around, you know, next month is springtime, right? So <laughs> I hope uh, the weather yeah. realizes that it's time to chill out. Pardon? Well, you hope. You hope. I said you'd hope the weather change. This is this is when I first came here ten years ago to the Coeur d'Alene area. <laughs> it was about two weeks from now uh, in 2004, and it was 80 degrees. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I can do this. And we had we had five below last night with a chill, and it was snowing oh all gosh. day yesterday. So well, I it's hope been, things it's will hairy. get better. It's, it's, it's and, crazy. Um... <laughs> I feel like I'm in Alaska again. And that we'll have you again for a Moodle MOOC 4 in June. I'd love to hear more. I know a lot of people uh, miss this, but they'll be watching the recordings. Thank you, everyone, for sticking to it. They, they, they wouldn't give up, you know? Everybody in the chat just kept saying, no, we're going to wait. We're going to wait. <laughs> so. Well, I sure appreciate your diligence as well. I, you know, tech, I had to fight with a bunch of 
tell my students, technology is great as long as it works like it's supposed to. And um, unfortunately, yeah, I had sorry. to fight I'm with a bunch of stuff to, to get the that. internet to work like it was But I'll tell to, you something. You know, I was, to I was, I was for, uh, you know, for managing, you seem <laughs> so you cool about everything, up. and I know that it must have been really hectic. Oh, no. No, it's... But uh, you did it, and I think that's, uh, that's what it's all about. And the process seemed easy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I recorded this through Camtasia, and uh, I can share the link Thank in MP4 yeah. with you if you're interested, and anyone else who's interested. And I'll be uploading this to Vimeo and YouTube. So thank you. And join us, Dale. By the way, you can copy the chat if you want to get the information, you want to see some questions, and go into the link that Thomas has added. So copy chat. I hope you can see the copy chat there um, in the sun. Yes, copy chat. Okay. All right. No, it, uh, right. Copy chat. Copy, copy chat. Chat copy to clipboard. Okay. Um, I'm going to send you. Um, I can I'm add that to the that course. Word doc with all those. Yeah, um, I can add that to um, MOOC. Very good. Viable research places. I'll do that. If you, if Thank you. Like Thank that. you, everyone. And if anybody's interested, you can maybe forward, forward them to them. Okay. Okay. Sounds good to me.